point two, a novel's first lines. So a few things we're going to be looking at here today, but I want to show you first of all where to find your files. So when you go and click your teams, you will see your files up at the top where it says files. Now, if you are on mobile, you're going to click the general thread and under general at the top, you will also see files. So you've got a couple different options. You have a PDF copy here. And once this loads, you'll see there's also a Word document that you can use as well. So I'm going to open the PDF and I have an app that can uh, mark up a PDF. So we're going to be looking at the excerpt from the sound and the fury, which will be on page three of your workbook. So we'll open up page three and we've got an excerpt from this novel. These are just the opening lines and I'm going to mark this up a little bit in the color purple today. So we see April 7th, 1928 through the fence between the curling flower spaces. I could see them hitting. So we've got them. We don't know who they are. We have a pronoun without an antecedent. And then look at this verb right here, hitting. So what's going on? Is there a fight? Is there something happening? I'm going to go ahead and highlight that because I feel like it is important. So I will mark up with a highlighter. They are hitting. I want to make note of that later. They're coming to where the flag was and I went along the fence. They, again, they were coming to where the flag was. Well, what kind of flag? So we're trying to figure out where we are in this story. We've got someone hitting something or someone. We've got a flag and we've got a fence. Luster was hunting in the grass by the flower tree. Now we've got a name, proper noun. We don't know who this person is or if it's a person at all. Could be a name of a pet animal or something. They took the flag out and they were hitting. Well, there it is again, that verb. They were hitting. Doesn't say what they were hitting, just they were hitting. Then they put the flag back and they went to the table. And he hit and the other hit. So we have this verb here again. Hit and hit. Then they went on and I went along the fence. Luster came away from the flower tree and we went along the fence and they stopped and we stopped. And I looked through the fence. So there is a separation here. I looked through the fence while Luster was hunting in the grass. Here, Caddy, he hit. They went away across the pasture. I held to the fence and watched them go away. Listen at you now, Luster said. Ain't you something? 33 years old going on that way. After I done went all the way to town to buy you that cake, hush up that moaning. Ain't you going to help me find that quarter so I can go to the show tonight? So this is the most dialogue that we get in this passage. I'm going to try and write dialogue with my mouse here. And it gives us a little bit better clue. Now we know that Luster is a person because animals don't talk, especially in this story. And then we see that a quarter would buy you an entrance into the show. Now this definitely is the late 1920s because you are not able to get into a theater, well right now at all, because of the quarantine, but for 25 cents, you can't even get a candy in the theater these days. So now, I know that you have some questions. If you want to go ahead and pause the video for just a second, and then I'm going to come back and give you some of the answers to these questions that this introduction brings to us. So we'll go ahead and start with this. What world have I entered? If you haven't figured it out by now, the narrator is watching a golf game through the fence. Perhaps some students drew this conclusion based on the gradual release of clues. Hitting, in this sense, is not a, a violent action, but it's actually just golf. Moving the flags and the caddy, that's also a golf term. The only other clue about this world or setting is that Luster is planning on seeing a show with a quarter, which we know dates it definitely because you cannot get in for 25 cents today. So who's our guide in this world? Well, your guide to the novel is the storyteller, the narrator. In this case, students, maybe you wondered the first person narrator has some kind of disability here because he uses simple and somewhat stilted language, despite the fact that he's 33 years old. Doesn't sound like a 33 year old, it sounds like a child. Put a little exclamation point there. So what voices do you hear? Besides the voice of the narrator, you hear a golfer saying, hear caddy. And then Luster reprimands the narrator for moaning and not helping to search for the quarter. And the relationships at play. It seems like Luster is speaking to the narrator almost like a parent, referring to buying the narrator cake and trying to direct his actions. 
So think about this. How different would it be if Faulkner had used a third-person narrator to explicitly describe a 33-year-old cognitively disabled man watching golf through a fence? Well, it would get rid of a lot of the mystery. We wouldn't have to infer anything. It would just be laid bare for us. Now, reading a third-person account of this scene would deprive us of unlocking the mystery of the narrator's perspective. Allowing the reader direct access to the narrator's thoughts enables a sense of empathy for this narrator. Now, Faulkner most likely knew that his opening lines would lead the reader to make some false assumptions, that he was watching a fight or something because of the word hitting. But if we establish a false start, it's actually part of the reader's journey into orienting themselves in the world of a novel. It's like uh, running into the wall of a maze and trying to figure out, okay, well, how am I going to get through this passage of lines because now I've figured out that I can't go this way. I've got to reorient myself and decide which way I'm going to go. So this is what Faulkner does in the opening of his story and it's a great way to grab the audience's attention because we have to figure out where are we based on textual clues.